you know, I was going to say that, that uh, Clay Christensen is the most impactful academic on American business that I could think of for the last 20 years with his books and his writings and, and his speaking about disruption. But in just talking to him a little bit earlier, I realized that he, you know, even describing him as an academic is not really sufficient. For example, before he even got his PhD, he started a company in high, uh, high technology materials, ceramics, uh, which was quite successful, called uh, CPS Technologies. And then he went to Harvard Business School at uh, the age of 40 when he already had five kids to get his PhD. So this guy is, you know, shows you can do things late in life. But not only that, then he joined the faculty immediately after getting his PhD because he was such a good student. He made tenure faster than any professor ever before at Harvard Business School. Uh, in the meantime, since then, he has set up a company called Innocite, which is a consulting firm that he's chairman of and his students run. He also has something called Rose Park Capital, which is a hedge fund that invests based on his theories about disruptive companies, which, get this, has had a compound annual return of 45% since it was founded in 2002. He also is the top official in the Mormon church for all of the northeastern US and Canada, where they, the lay people are the ones who are in charge. He's called an elder. But he is the top official and has to approve all of the bishops that are for each of the individual congregations. This guy's amazing. In addition, he is on the board of Tata Consultancy Services, so he's got a deep India connection. Clay Christensen, you're going to find this interesting. Well, thank you very much, David. I'm sorry to be so tall. For those of you who are on the front row, I'm uh, two meters three tall. That's my father's fault. <laughs> when, uh, when David mentioned that I, my first career was I had founded and run a company with some MIT professors, and I always had wanted to be a teacher. So at age 40, as the company was hitting its stride, I decided I would bail out and become a doctoral student all over again. And I brought with me a couple of puzzles as I left the, the real world to become an academic. One of the puzzles was, what is it that kills successful companies? Now, what kills poorly run companies is quite obvious. But if you look across the sweep of business history, almost every company, which at one point was widely regarded as unassailably successful, a decade or two later, you find them in the middle of the pack or at the bottom of the heap. I reached the strangest conclusion at the end of that piece of my study, and that is that it's actually the principles of good management that we teach at the Harvard Business School that sow the seeds of every company's ultimate failure. And I, I wrote a book about this called The Innovator's Dilemma, whose essential message was, if you become wildly successful because you do everything right, you're doomed. But then I figured out that on the other side of every one of those corporate fatalities was a great entrepreneurial success story. And so I spent the next eight years studying that side of the problem. And that is, if I'm running a corporation whose core engine of growth is leveling off, and I want to start a new wave of growth that will keep the corporation strong and exciting and vital, how would I do it in a way that killed a few other successful companies rather than my failing? And so we don't have a lot of time this morning, but I'd like to just try to summarize as many of these ideas as possible. And then I think in the afternoon when we have the breakouts, we'll have some time for a Q&A. So we've got on the chart there, if you'll put the first chart on the screen, gentlemen, the basic model called disruption that emerged from the first piece of my research. So I'll plot on the vertical axis here the performance of a product over time on the horizontal axis. Now, if you could please focus on that dotted red line there. What that suggests is that in every market, there is a trajectory of performance improvement that customers are able to utilize. Now, you can see by the distribution curve on the right that in the high end of every market, there are very demanding customers that can never be satisfied with the best products you can give them. 
And at the low end of every market, there are pretty simple customers that can be overserved by almost nothing. So that's the first element of this model. In every market, there's a trajectory of improvement that customers can use. Now, the second is represented by that blue line. So if I could get you to focus on that in the chart. And what that suggests is that in each market, there is a different trajectory of improvement that innovating companies provide as they keep introducing better and better products. The most important finding about this is this trajectory of technological improvement almost always is faster than the ability of customers to use the improvement. A good way to visualize that is if you go back to the mid-1980s when we were first learning how to do word processing on those early personal computers, do you remember how often you had to stop your finger to let the Intel 286 chip catch up to you? Because on the left-hand side of that diagram, the Intel chip wasn't even fast enough to keep pace with our fingers. But Intel has just kept introducing faster and faster chips that it could sell for higher and higher prices to more demanding customers. When they found themselves on the right hand of the, ch of the chart with the 3 gigahertz Pentium 4 processor, they had shot way beyond the speed that most customers in mainstream business applications could use. Now, what we observed is that some of the innovations that help companies move up that blue trajectory were incremental year-to-year -year improvements, as we've tried to depict with those little humps on the screen. And others of these innovations were dramatic breakthrough technologies. For example, in telecom, the transition from analog to digital and digital to optical constituted dramatic breakthroughs. It turns out, though, that it doesn't really matter technologically how difficult it is. The companies that are on the left-hand side of the diagram before these battles of innovation begin almost always are on the right hand, the, the top of the diagram, they're still the leaders when those battles are over. Because the impact of both of these incremental and breakthrough improvements is to help the leaders in the industry make better products that they could sell for better profits to their best customers. And almost invariably, the leaders in an industry lead in those innovations that we call sustaining, in that they sustain the business model and market position of the leaders. But we saw on occasion, however, that there was a different kind of technology that came into a market. We called this one a disruptive technology. And it's represented on the screen by that movement down market. And we use the word disruptive not because it was a breakthrough improvement, but instead of sustaining the trajectory of product improvement in the market at the time, it disrupted it by bringing to the market a product that actually wasn't as good. But it was more affordable and simpler and more convenient to use. It could take root in an undemanding application at the bottom of the market and then improve. And what we found is that almost invariably, an entrant company came in and killed the leaders when one of these disruptive innovations emerged. Now, after me, Michael Dell is going to come on stage. And when you see Michael, think about the diagram that you're looking at there. Because in the late 1980s, when they created their business, the leaders in the industry were companies like Digital Equipment and IBM, and Michael came down to the bottom of the market and introduced very low-cost, simple, entry-level computers and had a business model that could make money at very low prices. And then he just moved up and up and up and up and up and created a tremendous company in that way. And you'll see in a minute that most of the companies whose stock we wish we had owned started at the bottom of the market and then moved up. So the odds of success are very different. If the innovation in question is one that will help the leaders in the industry make better products, they could sell for better profits to their best customers. In fact, I will always bet that the leaders will win that. And if an entrant comes in, they will get killed. But when a disruption comes in at the bottom of the market, I will always bet against the leaders.